community cares about. I decided to lean in uh, to my role as the token computer scientist and, uh, and, and tell you about something that I think, it, it, from, from my point of view, is a little bit older work, but um, I think hopefully will sort of broaden your perspective a little bit on the way we think about machine learning and inspire, uh, you know, kind of inspire some of the, uh, uh, some, some maybe new algorithms, think about new hardware and, and so on. Uh, and, and this is rethinking automatic differentiation, which is kind of at the heart of, uh, you know, kind of all of these, uh, all of this machine learning stuff that's going on. Yeah, let's just hit, just hit play up there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And I want to mention that, uh, you know, this is, of course, primarily the work of uh, of some great students, uh, Tennis Octay, Alex Beetson, uh, Joshua Adewal, and uh, Nick McGreevy. All right, good, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start like at a really high level because I think it's kind of useful to really create context. And again, this is coming at the perspective of somebody who's kind of been doing machine learning research since before it was cool. Um, and the, uh, uh, you know, and we sort of break things down, right? Into, into broadly speaking, kind of three different categories. We think about supervised learning, things like classification and regression, right? Where we're essentially trying to learn some parametric conditional probability distribution. Uh, we also like to do unsupervised learning, where we can think of that as modeling sort of a joint distribution over everything. Uh, so here we might think of that as kind of the, the labels and the inputs together. Uh, this maps often to things like kind of density estimation, compression, of course, generative AI sort of falls into this space. And something I, I sort of said in a Q&A the other day that it maybe raised eyebrows was the kind of statement that this implies this. And this is just a, this is just Bayes' theorem, right? It's just saying that if I have, if I have a parametric form for the... Uh, or the joint distribution of everything, then of course I can ask for conditionals, right? And so uh, generally speaking, if I can solve this problem, I can kind of do everything I want. Uh, we also do think about reinforcement learning, which kind of takes a lot of different forms. Broadly speaking, we're trying to take actions in some sense to maximize utility. Often that's over time. We think of that as sequential decision-making, control, planning, banded algorithms. Uh, these kind of tend to land into the, the sort of RL space. And deep neural networks, everybody's super excited about these deep learning. Um, you know, they're, they're powerful, massively parametric function approximators, uh, and they're really useful for solving all these kinds of problems. But I just want to say that this is not the only game in town. There's lots of ideas, and you want to use the right tool for the right job. Deep learning is often the right tool for the right job, the job, but it is not always. Conceptually, the way we approach these kinds of things is, uh, you know, we're after generalization. Right? And this is fundamentally solving the problem of induction, like looking at past and trying to guess what's going to happen in the future. In general, that's impossible. Right? That's not a thing that we can expect to be able to do in the absence of making a lot of assumptions about the way the world works, uh, which obviously we're happy to do, but it's worth saying out loud that this is a thing that's important. And, uh, and often in machine learning, we refer to this as the inductive bias. What kinds of things, what kinds of structure I expect to be able to learn from the world? And we encode this in, for example, deep learning by thinking about architectures and regularization and so on, and invariances. Variances, this is kind of a different talk, but I think deep learning is, was kind of the wrong word for this whole area. The depth, I think, is less important than the invariances that we generally build into these things. So here I'm thinking about things like convolutional neural networks, transformers, and so on. The magic of that is sort of the groups that sit beneath the data and not the, uh, I would say that the depth is kind of useful, but not necessarily the most important part. Um, on top of this, of course, we need some kind of inductive principle. And this is something that I think is is kind of can get lost in the weeds when we think about physical systems often, right? Because we like energies and things. And energies are great because we can often map those to probability distributions and then think about things like maximum likelihood. But broadly speaking, we need to have some sort of fundamental principle about how we move from things we've seen before to how uh, to, to sort of things we're going to see in the future. Maximum likelihood is maybe sort of my favorite thing for this, although Bayesian inference maybe is, is arguably better. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, this all kind of falls into this category uh, that we often refer to as empirical risk minimization, which is this idea that we have some finite data set. We're using that to represent, uh, you know, to be a sort of representative sample of, of like 
kinds of things, uh, you know, the distribution that underlies the world. And we're hoping to fit some set of parameters such that we can do well on data we've never seen before. And so, you know, we have this word minimization here. And so uh, usually when we do machine learning, we are doing optimization, but not always. Of course, this is an old field. These days, we think of machine learning as being the AI that works, right? AI has been around for a long time. Machine learning has been around for a long time. Um, and suddenly, we like sort of put an equal sign between these things. Uh, but I, actually, as that last talk wonderfully motivated, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, we've been doing this for a, for a long time. Uh, and in fact, the perceptron going back to, uh, you know, going back to sort of 1957 uh, as a physical piece of hardware and uh, in our kind of modern sort of framing of the artificial intelligence problem kind of goes back to 1956 or so. Um, and so we've been doing this for a long time, and then suddenly it seems like it's gotten very exciting. Of course, it's worth worth asking, why did it get exciting? And the uh, you know, there's a couple of obvious answers, giant data sets. The internet has made it possible to gather enormous data sets of natural language and images and all kinds of things like that. So that's been a big deal. GPU computing, as we've talked about a lot, um, has you know, been a game changer for this because so many of these models just depend on doing matrix vector multiplications really fast. And um, that is a, uh, and that's something we've gotten pretty good at. And then of course, large bags of money have uh, have also contributed to this massively. And this kind of boil, this is generated with chat GPT, of course. The, um, uh, and what it boils down to here, right, is that there was a moment, uh, I don't know, sometime between 2010 and 2015, where uh, big tech companies realized that advances in machine learning hit their bottom line on like ad revenue very, very, very quickly. And uh, because you know you get a recommend, you have some recommendation on Amazon, ad gets shown to you uh, on you know Google search or whatever. Uh, the machine learning algorithms are sitting behind that, and so uh, you know we're talking about like hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap tied up in in uh, things that fundamentally flowing through machine learning. Companies realized that and started throwing outrageous amounts of cash at this problem. And so here we are. But there is another thing, uh, and this is the subject that I want to talk about today, which is I think an unsung hero of all of this, of course, is automatic differentiation. It's a thing that, uh, you know, in the modern landscape, of course, you know, people think about JAX and, and PyTorch, uh, but it wasn't always like this. <laughs> uh, the sort of auto diff has been around for a long time, but auto diff for sort of machine learning problems and in the kind of sort of like, uh, let's say the sort of like larger Python ecosystem is a relatively uh, is a relatively new development. The way it used to work, right, was that you read machine learning papers, you write machine learning papers, and sort of like in the battle days, a big, big part of the paper writing was deriving some gradients, and you put those gradients in the paper so that people could code them up. Uh, and this was kind of like an intellectual contribution. Like, this, so this is the LSTM paper, which is an unbelievably influential recurrent neural network paper. Uh, you know, and you like flip to the appendix and you got a bunch of gradients, right? And uh, and that was kind of like a big, big thing that people would do. Uh, but nobody does that anymore. Like, why would you ever do that? Nobody does, needs to do math to do machine learning these days. The uh, you just need to be if you write a paper, like you know. So this is you know a very very famous paper. Uh, now all you need to be able to do is communicate somehow to the, uh, you know, to the reader what the function is that you were trying to compute, and then whatever gradients you just ask PyTorch for those. And so you get these figures, you know, kind of like weird sort of data flow diagrams and things that kind of look like math, but are really almost like pseudocode or something. I mean, nonsensical from a mathematical point of view, but uh, but you can kind of you kind of like know what they mean. And so you could write that you can write that code for that. Uh, and so this has been a really big, you know, like a really big change in the way that this research has gone. And it's been very exciting, right, because people can rapidly iterate on all these different architectures without having to derive any gradients, without making those mistakes. Whatever they can just they can just write code and try things, uh, and that's been exciting. But it you know there's also a sort of like a less charitable view on this, which is that uh, it's resulted in a kind of like let's just sort of throw things uh, throw pickles against the window and see which one slide down fastest. Um, and uh, uh, this is a Billy Madison reference. The uh, uh, and you know that that because it's so cheap and easy to throw pickles against the window and try different deep learning architectures, we don't need to understand them. Uh, we don't need to sort of analyze them. We just spam them out and see what happens. And uh, that's a little frustrating from an intellectual point of view, uh, and also from the point of view of like really trying to figure out what the hell is going on here. Um, but 
one of the really exciting side effects, of course, of automatic differentiation is that it's made scientific com uh, computation easier. And uh, and I think sort of for this crowd, think of this through the lens of it making sort of uh, make it a lot nicer to build different kinds of solvers and, and simulators. Uh, you know, for example, you want to write some kind of you know you you want to code up some to solve some uh, mechanics problem. You know, essentially, if you write the code for your Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, you're going to get the equations of motion for free with Autodef, right? You just they just sort of pop out. You get that code with sort of no additional work. Uh, similarly, people have been really excited lately about uh, you know neural net ansatz. For uh, for wave functions, so here's like the Fermi net paper from DeepMind, uh, trying to uh, sort of solve the solve the uh, you know electronic Schrodinger equation uh, using a uh, using a neural network. Um, the uh, you know here again this is fun because the Laplacian you know super easy to get. Uh, it uh, you need that for the Hamiltonian, so uh, so if you can just ask the computer to give it to you very cheaply. Then that's that's cool. Then more generally, physics-informed neural networks and things like this, whether you want to think about, I don't know, elasticity, fluid dynamics, or basically any other kind of PDE you ever care about, uh, then it's pretty interesting to think about the kind of very large space of functions we get um, from things like neural networks and kind of thinking these as basis sets that we can now fit with gradient descent. I, I will admit to being a little bit of a physics-informed neural network skeptic, but it's nevertheless exciting to think about how we can kind of like pull all these things together. Then of course, more generally, outside of just building conventional simulations, it's also cool that we can make these simulations wrenchable. That's already come up several times uh, in talks here. And so people have been thinking about this for robotics, uh, you know, like here's some crazy like elastic robot. Uh, I think this is using like the material point method. Uh, here is uh, this, this cool uh, work that came out of Google, building a, a differentiable molecular dynamics simulator. Then of course, people think, have been thinking more generally about how to use these kinds of things to accelerate uh, PD solving. And kind of what gets me excited uh, it, as well is that it allows kind of interesting and tight coupling between physical simulations you might, might want to build and machine learning models to integrate with them and take advantage of them. Uh, so we've been excited, for example, about integrating machine learning models with things like mechanical metamaterials that can uh, can exhibit all kinds of interesting nonlinear behaviors that are, are sort of difficult to get otherwise. So here is a thing we call a neuromechanical autoencoder simultaneously trains a, uh, a neural network to sort of determine the boundary conditions of, uh, of a uh, mechanical metamaterial, the geometry of which has been jointly trained by a differential simulation, differentiable simulation. Then other things that are a little bit more conventional, like thinking about learned model order reduction, using these kinds of models that allows you to, uh, to reduce the degrees of freedom in like your finite element analysis. So what I want to do now is explain to you what automatic differentiation is. I suspect everybody knows what it is, but there's but also often I think people treat it as a black box. So I think it's worth spending a few minutes talking through it. And fundamentally, what it is is this uh, this kind of system in which I can write code to implement some function, and I get the Jacobian of that function at, with no additional work. And what makes it really amazing is that when you only care about a row of, or a column of the Jacobian, so you only care about a gradient example, but also a tangent, then you can provably get that quantity uh, in a sort of a small, that, that you can compute it in a small constant multiple of the cost of computing the original function. And here, that small constant multiple is like, you know, like four, okay? So, uh, so interestingly cheap gradients, and that has, of course, informed this whole thing. And, you know, the way this works, again, I'm sure people are pretty familiar with this. This is a uh, tool that we developed in my group called Autograd or back in 2014, 2015, that is kind of the, uh, it, well, JAX, right, stands for just Autograd and XLA. And so my former students and postdocs that went to Google uh, built JAX after building this. And PyTorch is more of a spiritual successor in that it kind of took advantage of, you know, it was kind of um, used it as an inspiration for its trace-based autodiff. But, you know, the name of the game here, right, is you write some function in NumPy, and, um, you know, and then you have this higher order function it gives you back whatever gradient you want. And in the case of, of uh, tools like, like uh, Autograd and Jax, then you know, we get, uh, you know, it's closed. We, we can apply it as many times as we want and get all of, these, all of these higher derivatives as well. So this is pretty cool. And of course, the way we use this in, uh, in sort of modern machine learning, uh, and all this is kind of obvious now, but I, I want to emphasize that this was not the way you could do things in like 2014. <laughs> this, uh, at least within the sort of Python ecosystem. We write down some neural network function, uh, we write down some loss. Um, 
that, uh, you know, kind of encodes our, our um, sort of idea of um, wherever our sort of inductive principle is. And so, you know, this is like uh, inductive bias, uh, inductive principle, and sort of empirical loss minimization, right? And then, of course, we get the uh, the gradients of these things for free. And and so, like I said, this is just, you know, what everybody does now. But I, I want to sort of emphasize that uh, relatively recently, this was, this, was, uh, this was new. And so the question is, how does this actually work? The way it works is, or like at least the perspective that I like to have on this, um, is that we, you know, we write down some function. We can think of that function as producing a computational graph in which the vertices correspond to these intermediate variables and the edges represent the sort of parental relationships on how, or the dependence on how these things got computed. And then uh, what we do with the autodiff is we think about the linearized computational graph in which we now the uh, partial derivatives of sort of vertex with respect to vertex on that edge, all of the edges. And then what we do, one way we could think about the chain rule is we can think about it as a sum over paths. So I want the derivative of f with respect to x1, say, then what I can do is think of that as a sum of all the paths between those two vertices. And within each path, I'm taking the product of those partial derivatives that are represented by the edges. And so, uh, so we wind up with this, um, this sum over products. So sum over paths, product over the edges in that path between those vertices. This uh, is one way to kind of think about what it means to compute a, uh, a Jacobian. And of course, this formula is a terrible way to compute it, it should be said. Uh, and so we have clever algorithms, dynamic programming, that allows us to, uh, to sort of solve annoying graph problems very efficiently. That's exactly what automatic differentiation is doing. So we have that linearized computational graph, and what we're going to do in order to sort of perform automatic differentiation is we're going to perform vertex elimination. And what that means is we have some vertex, and we're going to get rid of it by sort of rolling those edges into the into adjacent vertices, into adjacent edges. There's a collapse out at uh, that vertex, uh, vertex B in this case, and uh, and we can choose some ordering. In this case, I'm going from sort of uh, inputs to outputs, and this is this kind of topological ordering uh, of doing the vertex elimination. And what happens when we eliminate all of them, is we get edges just between the inputs and the outputs. Those are the derivatives. That's, those are the entries in our Jacobian. If we do it from inputs to outputs in this schedule, then we get what's called forward mode automatic differentiation. Of course, we could do it in a different order if we chose. We could instead do it from outputs inputs and uh, eliminate vertices that way, right? We could kind of walk backwards, get the same answer, of course. Uh, and this, the algorithm that we call backpropagation. And this, of course, uh, gets a lot of attention and is a thing that is often presented in this kind of mysterious way of errors kind of moving backwards through time or something. But uh, it is, it can be understood as uh, a dynamic program on this linearized computational graph. And what's kind of neat about that, well, I'll come back to what's neat about that in a second, but an annoying thing about that, I should say, is that uh, it, it means that we need to store all of the intermediate state when we're doing the forward pass in order to be able to walk backwards through these things. There is another view that I think is kind of worth uh, worth keeping in mind as well. We're talking about forward versus reverse mode, something that doesn't necessarily require you to think about graphs very much. You just think about function composition. You know, here's our sort of cartoon uh, neural network with where we have a bunch of functions that we're composing, we want to compute, say, the gradient of that composition. And that gradient, in the case of this kind of very simple composition, is just going to be a product of a bunch of Jacobian matrices for each part of the composition. And of course, matrix multiplication is associative, right? So we could choose any order for this that we want, right? And if I chose, well, and so matrix matrix multiplication, at least kind of like naively, is cubic, right? Grassen's algorithm notwithstanding. Uh, and matrix vector multiplication, quadratic. And so there's an interesting difference in deciding how I want to do my associative rules for matrix multiplication here. If I go right to left, then it's going to be a cubic algorithm. And if I go left to right, it's going to be a, it's going to be a quadratic algorithm. And there you go. That's why we like, uh, that's why we like reverse mode when we do, uh, when we do um, uh, optimization problems, because we have a lot of inputs and a scalar output and so if we do it backwards, then we get 
uh, then we get a quadratic algorithm. But of course, maybe we're parameterizing a high dimensional vector field with a small number of parameters. That's the thing we might want to do. And in which case, everything is kind of a little bit different. And now uh, it makes sense to go the other direction. Of course, in that case where we have a large fan out, that's exactly where we'd like bird mode. But an important point is these are just two extrema of all the possible schedules we could have. These are not the one true, the two true ways to compute uh, to, to solve automatic differentiation. You choose any schedule you want, and different schedules might have different properties. And so here's a, a sort of a schedule that is not forward or reverse, and actually is cheaper than both of them in this case, in terms of the total number of arithmetic operations. Uh, now, finding the uh, finding the best schedule is in p-hard, so that kind of sucks. So reverse mode often is the right <laughs> is the right approach to things that we uh, uh, that we care about. All right, now that's all been pedagogical background, and then we're almost out of time. But uh, so what I want to do though is I, I is I kind of want to make a particular point on the next slide here, which is so so he's been around for a long time, so this is not new. And um, it is, and there is a community that, that focuses on research on it and has for a long time. Disconnect, I think, largely has been that that community has kind of focused on the kind of applied mathy kind of domain. Think about solving PDEs where you need exact, um, exact derivatives. And there's this kind of mantra that informs all of this, which you kind of see in different papers about AD. It's got the first sentence in lots of papers about AD in some sense, which is uh, it's great because it's as exact as symbolic differentiation, but with no expression swell. So. Um, this is contrasting it with like finite differences, which is both slow and inaccurate, um, and trying to kind of um, make the case that symbolic differentiation is a different thing. Um, so I think there's a reasonable argument that if is symbolic differentiation just done with a compiler. Um, in any case, this win that I think we've all thought about with AD for a long time is great if your goal is something like, I don't know, adjoint sensitivity uh, analysis. But what we're doing with these gradients is kind of taking a drunken walk towards the minimum sum of some objective function. We're doing stochastic optimization, right? Some variation on stochastic gradient descent. And a question you might reasonably ask is whether exact AD is kind of baggage we should carry around if, we, uh, if we're doing stochastic optimization. Made a little more punchily, <laughs> we are burning up the earth computing these gradients. And we are computing them with high accuracy. You know, we're doing it like using like numeric accuracy for single single precision fully point generally. And then we use them for an incredibly absurdly noisy estimate in which we take like a hundred data out of a hundred billion data, right? And uh, inform this Monte Carlo estimate. And so there's a it's like a crazy conceptual mismatch here when we're doing all this work to get the exact gradient when we like fundamentally don't care about that accuracy. Right? And it's not like this is kind of in the noise of, of the energy usage of the planet either, right? I mean, I think, you know, the, the cost to train some of these models is comparable to the energy consumption of like entire countries. It's this algorithm, <laughs> right? <laughs> so maybe it's worth thinking a little harder about Autodef than we usually do. Right? The costs are so large. And so I'm going to tell you one way you might make it cheaper. This is not the only way. Well, certainly not the best way, but it's just like, I, I, but I think we just need to broaden our, sort of open our minds about what might be possible. And of course, what we really need in a sense is an unbiased estimate of this gradient, right? And that's what kind of what SGD wants. And when I see a sum like this Bauer sum, you know, I think Monte Carlo, important sampling, right? I think, I think about ways I might subsample that sum in order, to, uh, in order to do a better job. And of course, there is this immediate sort of naive thing where... I could sample a random path from my sum and get an unbiased estimate of the gradient of the whole thing. Right? And so I could, you know, take these random samples from, from this graph and compute the product along that, along that path, or I could do more than one if I wanted. And now I have an unbiased estimate of the, um, of the gradient. And in fact, it turns out that it, what we always do is a special case of this, right? So if you think about the problem we're trying to solve, as being this full batch gradient, right? Summing over all of the data. We take a subset of the data and you think about what's happening kind of at the end when you do that sum. And all we're doing is plucking off, we're sort of grouping the paths through this graph according to what data they touch. 
sort of bundling those together and grabbing some subset of those bundles of paths. So this is actually already what we're doing when we train these things. We're just, that's what mini batching is, is that, that is actually what mini batching is doing. However, this naive view is definitely not going to work. I mean, it's cool and it's fun and it's like a conceptual framework, but even sort of like a relatively simple multi-layer perceptron, it's already going to have an exponential number of paths with, uh, with depth, right? And the impact of that on our Monte Carlo estimate is going to be outrageous variance. And so probably we're not going to get much mileage out of this uh, kind of as I've shown you so far. I have to take advantage of problem structure in some interesting way. Um, and this is both, you know, it's good and bad. It's an opportunity, but it's also a little frustrating because we'd like something very generic. First step in this uh, that we've kind of been thinking about is, of course, doing the obvious thing, which is rather than thinking about, um, you know, thinking about our kind of vertices as being scalars, think about the vertices as being vectors, and then now the edges are Jacobian matrices. And so something like this, you know, kind of collapses into a chain. And then that chain is just a product. Uh, the, you know, the Jacobian is now just a product of matrices. And so we have, you know, so one thing we might do is uh, what we call random matrix injection. So here is, is the observation that if I have a distribution over matrices such that an expectation there are the identity, and I have independent matrices, and I can inject those inside, and the product will still be an unbiased estimate of the um, uh I will get an unbiased estimate of the product, and if I made those mat those random matrices sparse, then uh, then maybe I'm doing less computation or storing less state. Alternatively, I could make them like end them low rate matrices. You know, there's like a whole design space here you could potentially do where kind of like bottlenecking things with the uh, uh, with the gradient in order to get unbiased estimates. Um, importantly, this is in the backward pass, right? So this is state we're storing as we go forward. We're computing the real function but we're not storing all of the state and we're not doing all of the computation of the gradient on the way back. We're, uh, you know, we're doing some kind of compressed version of that. This turns out to be kind of an interesting thing. So looking at a couple different architectures, relatively simple uh, models, the, uh, so, you know, like a fully connected net, com net, recurrent neural net, and trying to think about it on a kind of like a memory, memory for memory basis, um, where we're saying, okay, if I care about memory, and what I could do is just use a smaller mini batch, right? That's like a super easy way to reduce the amount of memory per uh, per step. Um, how does that compare with interesting kinds of subsampling procedures? And what's fun is that and it, maybe it's not surprising, but that doing this kind of randomization is better than the equivalent kind of dropping of mini batches. And it boils down to kind of the obvious fact in some ways that you know, you're seeing more data now, and the data are kind of smooth in some sense. And so there's maybe diminishing returns in how much of the data you see. Uh, so you'd rather see, sorry, how what fraction of any given example you see. So it's better to look at to look at more. Oh, and then this uh, and then this is kind of comparing to like memory unconstrained kind of like conventional training procedures. Which it's worse then. Also fun to think about it in other kinds of contexts like simulation. So PD constrained optimization, as I mentioned before, is something that we might be excited about. And so uh, uh, Nick McGreevy, who's on this paper, is at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. And uh, so we looked at a simple uh, a simple kind of model for neutrons at a fission reactor, think about how you might want to optimize uh, the backprop through the solution of the, the differential equation in order to achieve some, uh, sort of achieve some target potential. And what was really interesting here is that essentially what we're doing is subsampling the solution in the gradient, so storing less of it as we go forward, then using that sparse, uh, using that sparse solution in the backward pass. And uh, here you can throw away like 99% of your memory, and do just as well as uh, as if you used all of it. Um, and maybe this isn't surprising because the whole point of like this term is I want a smooth function, right? And so uh, if I uh, if so if I expect to have a smooth function, then probably I don't need very much of it in order to in order to sort of get all the information that I need. This is, uh, I think, promising, uh, sort of a promising thing. All right, so I'm going to wrap up here so everybody can go skiing or whatever. Um, but the uh, the point here, you know, AD is this like unsung hero. But everything is happening now. And that we take it for granted that tools like PyTorch and Jax and all these awesome things kind of exist, but they they actually are relatively recent developments. They have represented a giant change the way this science is done. But I think also it's exciting because 
it's uh, it enables new ways to think about solving physics problems, right? And and, uh, and kind of makes life easier in interesting ways. But I think when we're solving stochastic problems, and I think I hope this really resonates with this crowd. But you know, if we had interesting computer hard hardware that could take advantage of this kind of structure, uh, if we could think really rethink the foundations of the way we do this computation, the sort of potential for energy savings and cost savings is enormous. And it's ridiculous that we're doing things the way we're doing it now. It's, utter, uh, it's just like total nonsense. And uh, you know, here's one potential way to, uh, uh, you know, this is like one potential idea for thinking about it, but I think it's only one, uh, one of many possibilities. Um, I sort of talked about memory because it's very hard to take advantage of sparsity in modern uh, hardware for the actual compute. Um, but you know what? Like the folks in this room are thinking about all kinds of other architectures. And so I'm optimistic that, uh, that there's interesting places to go. I'll stop there. Um, I uh, thank you guys for listening. And again, I want to emphasize that this is work of great students. Thanks so much for, for the great talk. Definitely wanted to welcome you all, given your perspective. So the specific question I had was regarding the injection of the random matrices. Uh, you had this approach where you essentially you pick PI so that you reduce the dimensionality. Yeah. So the question is, do you think about finding a low dimensional manifold where the gradient vector is supposed to be pointing, and do you resample that matrix like every 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 time you train? Like how often does it get resampled, and and like? Intuitively, how did you even design this? <laughs> yeah. So the um, um, so the answer is that we you know we resample it. Uh, let me just jump back here, like to these empirical results. The uh, so so actually, there's two different curves on here, depending on whether for like a given mini batch we resample the matrices for every item in the in the mini batch, or whether we use just one projection for all of them. Um, and uh, and it it sort of sometimes matters and sometimes doesn't. Um, do we take advantage of like where we expect kind of the gradient to be pointing or something like that? We don't. This is the most naive possible approach to this, but of course we're good at engineering probability distributions in different ways. Coming up with better estimators to lower the variance, uh, you know, important sampling and variance reduction, like this whole world of things we could be doing that we're not doing here um, because this is just sort of the first take. Uh, but I think, for example, we expect gradients to be have some interesting manifold structure. Totally blind to that here. I mean, you know, one hopes that random projections kind of preserve that structure, you know, re reduce isometry or whatever. But the uh, uh, we're not we're not explicitly accounting for it. One of the great things about this meeting is uh, uh, we've brought uh, many different uh, streams together. Uh, and one of the biggest problems is that uh, we have different nomenclature for the same thing. So uh, one of the most important things in your talk is automatic differentiation. And I'm saying is that a different word for something else. Now, the something else is the chain rule of calculus combined with linear. Is that what you mean by automatic differentiation? So, yeah, so, yeah, this is a great point. So, so, so the chain rule is what we're computing here. Uh, and when, we, when I write those matrices down, that is the chain rule. And there is a perspective on all of autodiff, which is congratulations on knowing the chain rule. Um, <laughs> But the uh, the point of like this here is that the chain rule consists of multiplying Jacobians, and uh, and so knowing the chain rule is not enough to compute it efficiently, and that there is a huge difference in the way that we choose to do that. That is the difference in actual significant significant in terms of asymptotic complexity, and so uh, and not for nothing, right? These might be billions of parameters, yeah. And so, uh, so the answer is, yeah, this is the chain rule, but this, this is about how do I efficiently compute the chain rule and how do I do it without having to think very hard? So uh, there's kind of like a, a wisdom in training low neural networks for low precision hardware where you can get away with super low precision on inference, but people always say you need high precision to compute gradients. And, Everything you said makes sense to me, but it doesn't seem to be consistent with this. Can you kind of like make these make sense? I, I mean, I don't have a precise answer to this, but I think the question probably is how do you um, adjust all of the other hyperparameters to compensate for that? And I think that's probably a hard problem. It's been this sort of hard one 
tuition about how big mini batches should be and uh and, and kind of different all these these sort of very ad hoc but kind of seem to work ways to train models and if you deviate from those it's often uh you know uh, you often kind of break things in annoying ways and i would expect that low precision models are just inhabit a different place in that hyperparameter space that we haven't explored very well and so um that would be my guess so uh, the reason I say that is because of these kinds of results where the kind of, uh, where the analogy here would be, well, if you're going to use low precision gradients, then you should have a bigger mini batch size example in order to get the same kind of quality. Yeah, I mean, there seems to be. Um, so, uh, I mean, empirically, I, I don't, the, uh, we have higher variance, right? And so, um, so this is the kind of like this baseline, right? Is as if you're totally blind to memory considerations at all. Um, and then here seeing what we're looking at is in the memory constrained world, what we, do we do? And the practical effect of that is, uh, is increased variance in our gradient estimator. And, you know, we pay, we pay for that. And, and we pay for that in theory too, right? I mean, that is to say that we can understand the convergence of a convex problem in terms of the variance of our gradient estimate. Yeah, but the, I guess that the, what you mentioned fairly early on with the talk is that the benefit of these neural networks is that you're going to be Well, so invariance here, what I mean is like group invariance of the architecture. Sorry, yeah, I mean, that that's another rant for another time and feel free to, to pounce on me if you'd like me to rant at you about it. But the, uh, uh, but, Essentially, what I meant by that was that the, in, the interesting jumps in successes of machine learning models over the last 10 years have more or less been exactly when somebody figured out how to build some kind of group invariance into a neural network architecture. And so whether we're talking about graph neural networks or comnets or transformers, right, these are kind of, you can kind of look under the hood and understand those as group invariance. Um, that's what I meant by that. Yeah, I mean, certainly that's exactly what the theory says, right? I've been talking about things in terms of, of of needing unbiased gradients, but that's actually not what the requirement is for sort of classic stochastic optimization. Exactly as you say, all we need is to kind of an expectation project in the, on on the right direction. Um, how to really take advantage of that um, when we kind of don't know a priori what the right direction is? I, I don't know how to do. I think I think your intuition is correct, though, that it, it kind of results in this interesting amount of robustness. Um, when we, you know, when we're computing things locally, and I think we're kind of seeing a similar effect here, but I, I'm not sure how to make that precise. Well, let's just have all the speeches again. <laughs>